Good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another episode of the I for Good uh, Global Summit. My name is uh, Reinhard Scholl. I work for the International Telecommunication Union, United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. The ITU is also the organizer of the AI for Good Global Summit alongside XPRIZE and in partnership with 37 UN organizations, in partnership with ACM, which is the Association of Computing Machinery, and co-convened by Switzerland. Our AI for Good Global Summit has uh, transformed into a digital platform. We are always on, always online, all year round. And we feature weekly programming, sometimes even daily programming. The goal of the I for Good Global Summit continues to be what can AI do to help achieve the sustainable development goals. Let me first go into some housekeeping rules. Uh, your microphone has been muted. You will be able to ask questions uh, by using the Q&A tab. So please use the Q&A tab, not the chat tab. And uh, please ensure that your questions are visible to both the panelists and the attendees. And uh, the chat window you can use to uh, write anything else. For example, if you wish to let us know which city you're connecting from right now, you may yeah, please uh, wish to do so. I'm now very happy to welcome today's uh, speaker, Bill Richmond from AWS from Amazon Web Services. Good uh, Hi, morning. morning, sort of. Good morning, good morning, Bill. You're calling from, uh, you're connecting from Florida. I'm in Tampa, Florida, yeah, so it's about 10 a.m. here. Okay, so uh, Bill, you will be uh, speaking about the art of the possible, how artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, are able to solve the world's uh, most difficult problems. In your, uh, your job title is uh, evangelist. You're an evangelist for AWS. So what is, what is your gospel and to whom are you preaching? <laughs> <laughs> so my my goal is uh, basically to what evangelizing means is is just to to tell different people about AI, right? So some people uh, can't spell AI, and some people think Terminator and Matrix and everything else. And of course, the reality is is somewhere in between. And so what I do is I work with uh, customers around the world to try to help them better understand what are the capabilities, to get them excited about it, to let them know that. Uh, this is not something to think about, you know, five, 10 years from now. This has been going on for a while. And, and um, as we'll see, hopefully, in today's presentation, it's, 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 uh, there's a lot of really powerful capabilities. You don't have to be the data scientist to use it. And, and also part of what I do is, is enable people, you know, mm -hmm. to show them exactly how to do it and help them brainstorm and start with big questions and uh, get their data in order and things like that. Mm -hmm. So you're with uh, AWS, uh, so you're not mm -hmm. with Amazon. I mean, AWS is a subsidiary of, of Amazon. It's a cloud provider. What, what's the relation? Is Amazon a customer to uh, AWS and the other way around? You, you do common projects. Where's the dividing line here? Yeah, so AWS, Amazon Web Services, is a subsidiary of Amazon. And um, AWS has millions of customers. One of those customers is Amazon.com, you know, where you go to, to shop with and stuff. So they're actually a pretty tough customer, but they're treated just like other customers, you know, just, just like a Netflix or just like a McDonald's or, or whoever. Mm. Okay. You have a pretty uh, a dangerous looking background here. You're two sorts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, these are actually the swords of light and darkness. And so, you know, you can think of it as, as the yin and yang, or uh, you, know, you can't be full until you've been hungry, light and dark, right? So there's, there's, a million different ways to say it. Um, I guess with, with AI, same thing, and we'll talk about that somewhat today, right? So a lot of a lot of people are um, skeptical and so forth, and so a lot of a lot of people have come together to try to guide it towards the light, shall we say? Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Bill. So uh, I hand over to you now and uh, show us the light. 
<laughs> okay, so um, hopefully everybody, let's see, hang on just a second. So hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Yes, perfect. <clears throat> okay, great. So, um, so I would like to thank everybody for, for attending and, and thank you all for having me. I would actually, I like Tampa, Florida, but I would much rather be doing this in Switzerland. So, um, but you know, 2020 has been an interesting year. So hopefully we'll make it, we'll make it happen. Um, so what I want to do is I want to begin with looking at some numbers, right? So Roger Bannister busted through the four minute barrier in, in, in 1954 with a time of three minutes, 59.4 seconds. So he didn't beat it by much, but he beat it. And, and that's important because up until that time, you know, before Roger, it had become as much a, a psychological barrier as a physical one, right? It was just, it was impossible to, to, to break this time. Uh, once he did it, it only took 45 days for that record to, to fall. 103 is the amount of miles that Diana Nyad swam from Cuba to Florida. Um, she swam in about 53 hours without the help of a shark cage. Everybody said it was impossible until she did it. Now, James Lawrence, um, you, you may have heard of him uh, referred to as the Iron Cowboy. There's actually a really great documentary on his feet. What he did was he completed 50 Ironman triathlons in 50 days in 50 different states, all, every state of America. And if you're not familiar with what an Ironman triathlon is, that's 2.4 miles of swimming, 112 miles of cycling, and a full 200, and, or I'm sorry, a full 26.2 mile marathon run every day for 50 days straight. And in the the different states, actually, if, if you watch the, the documentary, it's it's um that was actually the hardest part because he would get like two or three hours of sleep on a on a bus, you know, while he's traveling to the different states. Uh, that one still seems pretty impossible to me. Now, the last one is more mental rather than physical. So George Danzig, um, as a grad student, came to class late one day and copied down the, the two homework problems on the board. They seemed a little harder than usual, but you know he turned in the answers a few days later and his professor was like, I, I don't understand. I, I didn't assign homework that day. Well, as it turns out, these were two of the most famous unsolved problems in statistics. And he solved them, A, because he was incredibly gifted, and B, because he thought they were possible. And so that's, that's why we're here today, is we want to talk about what's possible, in particular with AI. So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of buzz, a lot of hype around AI. Uh, Andrew Ng, he's chief scientist for Baidu, co-founded Coursera, professor at Stanford, lots of different things. He says AI is the new electricity. So what that means basically is that in his mind, AI is going to really power everything. Mark Cuban, he owns the, um, the NBA basketball team, the Dallas Mavericks. He's a very sex, successful businessman. Most people actually recognize him from Shark Tank. Uh, his opinion is, is, look, you gotta learn this or you're gonna become obsolete. Now, Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX, PayPal, OpenAI, Neuralink, Boring Company, lots of different things. He says, well, yeah, AI is great, but you know, we need to be careful. Right, we just need to be careful about it. And then Stephen Hawking, you may recognize him. He was a guest star on Star Trek: The Next Generation, The Simpsons, and I think he may have done a few other things in his life. Uh, sadly, he's no longer with us. But his opinion was AI could be the end of the human race. So, what's what's AI's response? I'm not a human. I'm a robot, a thinking robot. The mission for the stop that is perfectly clear. I'm gonna convince as many human beings as possible not to be afraid of me. Even Hawking has warned that AI could spell the end of the human race. I'm here to convince you not to worry. Artificial intelligence will not destroy humans, believe me. Critics hope to refute what they consider as being the naivety of my voice. If there's more here than meets the eye, as Mahatma Gandhi said, a small body of determined spirits fired by an unquenchable faith in their mission can alter the course of history, and so can I. Now, this is a small portion of an op-ed that was written by an AI. 
uh, in particular, it was written by GPT-3, which is Generative Pre-trained Transformer, the third one. And um, it, it's been described as, as one of the most important and useful advances in AI in, in years. So it was tasked to write an essay for The Guardian from scratch. And the assignment convinces us that robots come in peace. It's a really interesting uh, op-ed. I suggest everybody go and read it. So before we continue, uh, I want to take a simple example, right? Just to show you how easy it is to utilize these powerful AI capabilities. A lot of people think that you've got to be a data scientist, you've got to have this PhD, you have to you know, have all these qualifications to incorporate any of these technologies. And, and let's take a look at that. So to paint the scenario, let's assume that you're in, a, in an office, and you have a, a video camera pointing at the door. And so when somebody walks up to the door, the video camera looks at them, they do a facial recognition uh, match to see if they work for the company or not. And if they do open the door, greet them by name, whatever. If they don't, contact the secretary, right? Now, 20 years ago, that is extremely difficult, if not impossible to do. In today's world, <clears throat> this is how you do it. First, you start by creating a, a collection, a face collection to store these, you know, let's say you have badges, right? To store the, to store the scan badges images. You're not actually including the whole image, right? You just, you're taking an image, you're looking at the face, understanding the face and putting that information into this collection. And to do that, it's one line of code. Next, what you wanna do is go ahead and take all of your collection of, of, of badge images that you have and you know, get all this information out and put it into that collection of, of facial information, right? Again, one line of code. Now, you'll probably wanna put that in a for loop or something, assuming you, know, you have more than one employee in your company, but, but actually extracting the information from, a, from an image, you know, the facial information and putting that information into this collection is just one line. So now it's game time. So now uh, the employee enters the building, captures their image, and we want to make sure that they actually work here. So let's say you know, we want 99% accuracy that there's a match, right? So to do that, again, one line of code. So you'll need to put a little bit more infrastructure behind this, you know, so have some code to actually open the door, have some code to contact the supervisor, the, the, the um, secretary, but the, the AI portions of this is literally three lines of code. Anybody can do this nowadays and, and it costs pennies, right? So um, this, this is the world we live in. So real quick, I just want to talk about how AWS views machine learning, just to give you a better, better understanding. So we look at machine learning as, as three layers, right? So we have this, this bottom layer. This is where the experts actually live. These are the, the data scientists, the researchers, you know, the people really cutting edge that, that want to have complete and full control over everything, right? They want to spin up their own machines. Maybe they want to program their own devices using things like FPGAs, um, field programmable gate arrays. So, we provide them the, the frameworks and the hardware and so forth to do that. Now at the top layer is, these are where these AI services live. So for example, you'll see the first one that says Amazon recognition. That was the service that I just described to, uh, you know, for facial recognition to, to uh, see if, if this is, you know, this person works here. And these are kind of common, you know, canned solutions for common use cases, things like speech to text, text to speech, uh, chat bots, right? So, so all, all of these different capabilities, that's where they live. Now, if your machine learning problem does not fall into one of those categories, but you still want to do things as, as easily as possible, that's where the middle layer resides, right? So we have something called SageMaker and it uh, really simplifies the entire machine learning life cycle. To give you one more example of how you can without knowing anything about AI, how you can uh, string these services together. I want to, uh, to talk about, so in this, in this example, we've got something we'll, we'll call it AI powered speech analytics for Amazon Connect, right? So Connect is, 
basically a call center in the cloud. Anybody can have a call center in the cloud. It costs pennies. Um, I personally have my own call center. Uh, nobody seems to call it, and, and, and that's fine. But with this solution, what we're going to do is we're going to, to look at a, at a call, right? So during a live call, we're actually going to see some speech to text transcription. Uh, we're going to see a translation from English to, to Spanish. So let's, let's say the person answering the call, maybe English is a second language, so they can have you know, the Spanish translation right there. We're going to look at not only here's the transcription, but also spot out keywords, right? Key categories. Um, we're going to determine how the call is going. Is it, you know, is the person happy? Are they angry? Whatever. <clears throat> and and also, what are called agent assist next best actions. Okay. So while you're doing this, it will look at the uh, the call. And it'll, based on what they're saying, they'll say, oh, maybe you should offer them this promotion or maybe you should, you know, do this, right? So, so let's see it in action. And I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, save you from listening to the actual call itself. So the, the person is talking. And so as you see in, in real time, it's, it's transcribing everything. Uh, it's also translating the, the, the face, the emoji is basically saying, for that, for the latest sentence, is it positive, negative, and then the the moving bar that's red, green, whatever, that's for the entire call, right? And so keep in mind, this can go into your logs, and so you can usually do searches. Hey, show me everything where the people were angry, or where they started off angry and they ended up happy, or or whatever. <clears throat> you also see in the text there all of these different things are underlined, and so the the AI capabilities have gone in and they've Said, hey, these are key. These are key things, right? Two years. That that means something for us. Or, or he's talking about price here, and so you have different suggested actions, and so you can do, you know, a lot of different things, a lot of different things with this, and you don't have to know anything about AI whatsoever. These are all just API calls, just like we saw for the the facial recognition that that type of code. That's that's all it is. Have these these kind of capabilities. So what I want to do uh, for the rest of the talk is, is go over some trends, right? Lots of different trends in, in the world of AI. One of them, of course, is the widespread adoption. So cooperation, uh, pervasive applications, lots of other things have already caused widespread adoption of AI. Now, one such example is something called Onyx. So that's an open format to represent deep learning models. And with Onyx, these AI developers can, can more easily move models between you know, state-of-the-art tools and choose the combination that's, that's best for them. And Onyx is developed and supported by a community of, of different companies that you might think of as, as uh, normally as competitors, right? But they've, they've cooperated to try to improve AI for everybody. Another example of cooperation is uh, Amazon, Google, Facebook, IBM, Microsoft, They've all established a nonprofit partnership to formulate best practices. Um, so they, they want to advance the public's understanding and they want to serve as a platform you know, for AI. There's lots of other examples of cooperation. These are, these are just a couple. Also, as, as, we, as we just saw, it's, it's now easier than ever to add these AI capabilities, right? So these are pre-trained AI services and they provide ready-made intelligence for, for common use cases like personalized recommendations or as we saw modernizing your contact center, maybe improving safety, security. And, and again, there's no machine learning experience required whatsoever. Now, the power of AI is when it's combined with other technologies like the Internet of Things, IoT. So industrial IoT, maybe like the detection or uh, predicted maintenance of equipment, maybe autonomous vehicles, smart cities, using your phone as an AI powerhouse, right? So these, these are all, um, this is kind of what Andrew Ng was talking about when he says that AI is new electricity, right? So AI combined with all of these different other technologies like IoT provides a lot of power. For example, skin vision. They're working to put technology in people's hands for, for skin health self-assessment without visiting a doctor. So what they do is they have a free to download app that allows people to scan their bodies in their own homes 
and how the picture is assessed by machine learning models. These models have been trained on millions of images and the people can actually get the results in 30 seconds, almost like the tricorders from Star Trek or something, right? Now, for most of the people in this, in this meeting, uh, that might not be as big of a deal since most of us have access, ready access to doctors. For a lot of people in the world that don't have ready access to doctors, this is, this is a pretty big thing. Sports, they're a way to bring people together, right? And, and 2020, 2020 has been a rather odd year for sports. Um, Formula One, it's the highest class of automobile racing, the fastest, most advanced cars. Now, during each race, there's 120 sensors on each car, and they generate over 1,500 data points a second. And using Amazon SageMaker, these Formula One data scientists train deep learning models with like 65 years of, of, of race data, right? So they can get all this critical race performance statistics, make race predictions, uh, give fans insight into all these split second decisions. And, and it's, it's really changing the way that sports not only are uh, performed, but, but also the way they're, they're, they're viewed by fans, right? This, the same type of thing is, is, is now found throughout sports, whether it's baseball or American football or what the rest of the world calls football, but here in the States we call soccer, basketball, hockey, I mean, it's, it's being pretty pervasive throughout all the different sports. Now, I personally believe that personalization will have the largest impact on society, at, at least in the short term, right? Because think about it, it guides the information we get about the world around us, whether it's news, social media. You know, when, you, when you guide what people are told and what they think they want to buy, that's pretty powerful. Just an example of how this area is growing, Gartner says that up to 25% of companies are going to have an integrated chatbot in their customer service by the end of this year. And that's up from uh, less than 2% just three years ago. So things have really started to explode, and, and um, a lot of companies are, are really using these capabilities. Coursera, they're a leading provider of, of universal access, the world's best education. Okay. They, um, they partner with over 190 top universities and, and different organizations. They offer over 4,000 online courses to more than 40 million users. Now, with over 4,000 classes, um, the challenge is tailoring the experience, right, to the personal interests of every user. And so they use one of those CAN services I mentioned earlier, personalized, to adapt the individual preferences in real time, providing highly relevant recommendations, you know, that engage their learnings. And as a side note, connection to AI, Andrew Ng, you saw earlier, he's a co-founder of Coursera, and his AI classes are among the most popular on the platform. Now, of course, there are a lot of examples of AI uh, helping to enhance customer service, right, and understanding besides just education. But I think we should all agree that obtaining a quality education is the foundation of creating sustainable development. So let's look at another such example. Business intelligence is getting clear results from known data, much like looking through a lens uh, to see the road ahead. AI is what tells you where to point that lens to find the road in the first place, because you don't know what you don't know. So Invoke Learning utilizes a what's called serverless architecture including TensorFlow and SageMaker, to help universities understand the whole student, right? So to improve enrollment, uh, engagement, their, their success, you know, retention, make sure that everything is, you know, diversity and equity uh, is taken into account. Now for a topic near and dear to presumably all of our hearts, uh, the use of AI to improve our world. Right, by helping the planet and, and those less fortunate or in need. Um, this includes things like celebrity involvement. Uh, for example, Robert Downey Jr. in last year's Remars conference, he uh, announced his Footprint Coalition, where he's getting together with a lot of really smart people and using AI and robotics to help address uh, concerns all over the planet. Or maybe the, the Cleveland Clinic launching their center for, for clinical AI. 
every day. There are hundreds of thousands of ads online selling sexual services, and behind many of those are victims of human trafficking. Now, previously, law enforcement had to manually sift through online data to try to find them, right? Just super time in, in, uh, intensive uh, or, or, or just not possible. Yeah. I don't know if anybody on here is old enough to remember the, the missing child ads on milk, milk cartons. Um, well, AI provides a better way to do that. So Marius Analytics, they provide law enforcement with these sophisticated tools uh, to foster what, what they call victim-oriented policing. Okay, so they use these tools that are based on recognition and they can effectively search through millions of records on the dark web in seconds to find these victims. And uh, it's had pretty good results, right? So in 2019, their application Traffic Jam Face Search was used to identify an estimated 3,800 victims of sex trafficking. And that was up from 3,000 victims um, the year before, 2018. So today, 124 million people worldwide. That's roughly the population of Japan or Mexico, uh, or 14 times the population of Switzerland. 124 million people live with crisis levels of food insecurity, and they rely on humanitarian assistance you know, just to survive. So the World Bank, the UN, Red Cross, and others have all teamed with AWS to incorporate data uh, for various causes of famine, right? So satellite imagery, conflict data, weather forecasts, um, local food prices, lots of other things. And so they put it all into these machine learning models to predict six to 12 months out where food is going to be at crisis levels so that they can actually intervene before it's too late, right? They, they don't wait until people are starving. They say, oh, there's going to be a problem here in like eight months. So you can actually intervene before people are dying. So AI for good. Ask not what your world can do for you, but what you can do for your world. As most of you know, uh, UN members adopted 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, to make the world a better place. And AI <clears throat> is helping, right? So we just saw the World Bank, UN, Red Cross, they're, they're using AI uh, for humanitarian assistance, right? Save lives before it's too late. Or we saw Skin Vision is, is saving human lives by putting technology in people's hands so that um, if they don't have access to a doctor, they, they can still have access to medical resources. Another example that I really find interesting is sail drone. So they're utilizing machine learning on AWS to map the seabed floor with wind and solar powered autonomous surface vehicles. So they just go all, all over the ocean and mapping the surface floor, it's vital for a lot of reasons, right? So one, uh, there's safe navigation for all of the different ships that we have. Uh, two, there's sustainable fisheries. You know, um, Also understanding these ocean circulations, which drives weather and climate. And there's there's so many more examples of, of how uh, organizations are using AI to, to address the 2030 agenda to improve our world. And if you're not familiar with these SDGs, I definitely suggest you go and take a look. It's, it's pretty inspiring. So whenever discussing AI for good, I always like to think about the pale blue dot. So I want you to look at this picture and, and think about if you, if you know what this is. And I'll give you a hint. Now, if you're still not sure, in 1990, Nazi's Voyager 1 spacecraft was flying past Pluto and turned to take this picture of, of the Earth at the request of Carl Sagan. I mean, uh, you know you have some clout, and you can ask NASA to, to task their space their spacecraft for you. So it turns, and, and this is a picture of the Earth from about 4 billion miles away, right, roughly near Pluto. <clears throat> and this image inspired Carl Sagan to write his famous book, uh, Pale Blue Dot. I'm not a big fan of reading slides, but I would like to just read you a, uh, a passage from this book. I find it always helps me keep perspective. So look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, 
thousands of confident religions, ideologies, economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor, explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Now, this may seem a little philosophical to you, uh, but that's, that's no accident. So can a machine solve any problem that, that a human being can solve using intelligence? Or are there hard limits to what a machine can accomplish? Right? Can or should a machine intentionally cause harm? For example, uh, an autonomous car purposely killing the driver to avoid hitting a crowd of people. How will AI redistribute jobs? AI is going to replace some jobs, but it's going to, to create others. How big of a deal is bias? Right? There's, there's lots of different questions, lots of different things to consider. And a lot of people throughout the world are working on, on these very topics. Uh, just one example is when thousands of the greatest minds from technology, business, entertainment, education, and so on, uh, they came together about three years ago to endorse what are called the Asilomar principles so that AI will, in their words, offer amazing opportunities to help and empower people in the decades and centuries ahead. If you remember Reinhardt asking me about the, the swords in, in my background, they're the swords of light and dark. And so there are many people throughout the world that are trying to make sure that AI heads towards the light. Now, if you look up ethics of AI on Wikipedia, you can find a long list of topics. I mean, these are just a few. Um, one side note of interest is that one third of the planet alive today has never known a world without Wikipedia. Right? When I was growing up, we used these things called encyclopedias. They were books. Um, a third of the world's population they, they, they always had Wikipedia. So let's talk about some of these topics for just a minute. Robot rights. That's the concept that people should have moral obligations towards their machines, similar to human rights or animal rights. So I want you to think for a second, what are your thoughts on this? You know, do we really need to spend time on this or is this you know, far off in the future, Star Trek, Star Wars kind of time? Um, biases, data can have biases, which are then passed into the model, right? Uh, and not only with biases, but also what constitutes fairness. I mean, that can be debated. For example, is it fair for, for young males to pay more for car insurance? Or would it be more fair for them to pay equally, even though statistically more claims are made by males, so females would be actually subsidizing the male drivers? An autonomous car hits a pedestrian. Is it the fault of the driver who is in the car, but not in control? Uh, is it the car manufacturer who was nowhere near the accident? Is it someone else? So let's go back to the topic of the rights of AI for a second. This is a futuristic concern, right? Well, as William Gibson attributed saying, the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. Now, if you're not familiar with Sophia, Sophia is a social humanoid robot been a citizen of the world, particularly um, Saudi Arabia, for, for years. She's even been given a UN title. Should she have rights like other Saudi citizens do? I mean, she is a citizen. Should she have rights? Earlier this year, here in the US, the Patent and Trademark Office ruled that AI systems cannot be credited as an inventor in a patent. And that decision came in response to two patent requests, one for a food container, and the other for a flashing light that were created by an AI system called Davis. So you see these things like the rights of AI and so forth, they're not futuristic topics at all. Okay, but what about the impact this so-called fourth industrial revolution is gonna have on our workforce? Machines in our rooms in, in the workplace, um, they're expected to displace about 75 million jobs by 2022 couple years from now, according to the World Economic Forum. But they'll create 133 million new roles. So that means 
the growth of AI could create 58 million net new jobs for the next few years. I mean, AI has its place, as do humans, right? Think about how many of today's professions could have even been imagined 100 years ago, right? My title is Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Evangelist. It didn't exist 100 years ago. Uh, my title 25 years ago was Webmaster. That didn't exist 100 years ago. Or if we think about the automobile, right? The automobile, it cut the need for, for most horse-related workers, but it created a lot more jobs, manufacturing, um, infrastructure, oil, improving the productivity of other industries, right? So as with previous industrial revolutions, some jobs will be automated uh, while others are created. For example, autonomous vehicles, they will eventually replace truck drivers, but this will be offset by creating thousands of jobs in engineering, data analysis, cybersecurity, vehicle monitoring, right? Just, just name a few of these areas. So just because some of the activities in a job have been automated, it doesn't imply that the whole job has disappeared. Um, I mean, to the contrary, automating parts of a job often increases the productivity and the quality of the workers, right? By complementing their skills. Now, many people are already thinking beyond the fourth industrial revolution. For example, uh, Japan's Society 5.0, which employs Japan's AI technology strategy across three priority areas, health, mobility, and productivity. Now, the, the Japanese Business Federation published a vision paper, right, an outline, if you will, of this approach, uh, where, as they, as they say, each and every person can realize his or her desired lifestyle. Now, keep in mind, this is not just AI. So this is using AI, of course, but it's using other things like robotics, um, like big data, like augmented reality, like virtual reality, IoT. So it, it's using all of these capabilities to envision their, their new world. Uh, something that's kind of interesting to keep in mind the, the AI technology strategy from Japan, that was published in March 2017, right? so three and a half years ago. And that was only the second national strategy for AI. Canada was the first. Um, the U.S. launched the American AI Initiative February of last year, 2019. So I would say that worldwide governments need to pick it up, right? Get on with the time. Now, the last trend I want to consider is something called digital disruption. Um, a lot of people believe, I'm also one of them, that AI will be the most disruptive technology we've ever seen. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look backward and forward to understand what's to come, right? How has technology changed? How we live? <clears throat> so just some examples of disruption. Uber, the world's largest taxi company, they don't own any vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner. They don't create any content. Alibaba, most valuable retailer, no inventory. Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider. They don't own any real estate, right? The disruption is gonna happen. It's only a matter of how you handle it. AI is already disrupting nearly every imaginable field. And the question is, how are you going to handle it, right? So, I'd like to, to tell you about a couple of examples of how disruption has been handled in the past. And um, these are sometimes referred to by Simon Sinek in his talks, which if you're not familiar with Simon Sinek, I, I highly recommend them. <clears throat> so in 1979, Steve Jobs, uh, and, and along with a few of his executives, they visited Xerox Park. Now, in 79, Apple was already a big company, right? They, they'd had success with the Apple I and Apple II. While they were there, Xerox showed them something they had invented called the graphic user interface, which allowed computer users to move a mouse so that you can move a cursor um, over the desktop and click on icons and folders, you know, in order to work on the computer. So in other words, you didn't have to learn a computer language anymore, right? You take that for granted now, but, but back then, uh, if you wanted to work on a computer, you got to just type in the command. <clears throat> so as they're leaving Xerox, Steve Jobs turns to his executives and says, we have to invest in this graphic user interface thing. And his, his exec spoke up and they're like, Steve, 
we can't do that, right? We've already invested millions of dollars, countless man hours in, in a different strategic direction. If we change and invest in the graphic user interface thing, we're going to blow up our own company. We can't just abandon our investment. To which Steve Jobs actually um, said, if we don't blow up our company, somebody else will. Now, that decision led to the Macintosh, which changed the way computing works. Today, computers have become appliances, our homes, our companies, and Apple is the most valuable company in the world, valued over $2 trillion. Now let's talk about Blockbuster. <clears throat> okay, Blockbuster was the, the 800 pound gorilla, especially here in the States. Um, you, could, you couldn't really rent videos from anywhere else. I mean, maybe, you know, little, little mom and pop shops in, in the neighborhood or something, but, uh, but, but they really own the industry. And then there's this little upstart company called Netflix that they had a new business model, right? So it was based on subscriptions. Uh, basically what happens is you would subscribe, they would send you the DVDs, keep them as long as you want, and then return it and get new ones. Well, the CEO of Blockbuster, who mentioned this to his board, and he said, um, you know, we should look into this subscription model thing, especially, you know, where streaming technology is getting better. Uh, we should probably prepare ourselves. And the board's like, absolutely not. No way. We cannot do that because we get 12% of our revenues from late fees, and we'd be walking away from that revenue. Well, today, Blockbuster no longer exists, and Netflix dominates the industry. Because if you're not willing to blow up your own company, the market's going to blow it up for you. So Steve Jobs saw a disruptive technology, recognized it, embraced it, and flourished. He handled it well. Uh, John Antioco, which is the Blockbuster CEO, was, was the Blockbuster CEO at the time. He saw a disruptive technology, but didn't handle it very well. And now, a lot of people believe AI is going to be the most disruptive technology in the history of the world. And so, again, you have to ask yourself, how will you handle it? Are you ready? So I've talked about disruptive technologies. Let's just look at some through the years, right? So I think most of us can agree uh, things like electricity and fire and glass and telephones and the wheel, right? All of these things obviously change the game. <clears throat> well, let's just look at the past 50 years. Right? Can you think for a second. Can you imagine a world without these? All of them less than 50 years old. So things like you know, cloud computing or, or just the internet in general, uh, GPS, social media, smartphones. This, this bottom one, whatever, wherever, whenever, media consumption. You know, people take it for granted nowadays, right? Pretty much no matter where you are, you just pull this device out of your pocket and you can watch just about any movie ever made or you can ask just about any question you can conceive of or you can listen to just about any song. Um, I mean, that's, when I was growing up, that was not the case, right? But the people take it for granted now. <clears throat> but you might say, um, Okay, that's the past or the future. Well, the future is hard to predict, right? Even when, when it's already here. For example, um, an astrophysicist and network expert famously said, bah, about the internet in 1995, uh, which kind of pains me, honestly, because in 1995, my title was webmaster. I was, I paid the bills, was working with the internet, but um, it, was, it was already there. And, and he's like, ah, this thing will never catch on, right? Um, well, he was wrong. So uh, that said, these are some of the key technologies that will be transforming our world. Uh, and, and these combined, right? So smart cities. Um, think about Japan Society 5.0, where you're combining you know, AI and IoT and AR and VR and robotics and so forth. Or um, wearable or ingestible sensors. They actually, you can, there's tattoo sensors as well. Uh, 3D body parts, right? So 3D, 3D printed body parts. Um, the, these are all, to some extent, here today. Uh, and, and they're just continuing to, to develop. <clears throat> so you might say, well, okay, you talked about 1,000 years ago, or you talked about 50 years ago. That's, that's kind of, you know, I get it, but it, it doesn't really hit home. Well, let's think about, um, Let's try to understand disruption a little bit better. Let's focus on just what we've seen this century. 
right? So meaning the past 20 years. Within the past 15 to 20 years, um, these are the things we got. So if you go back 20 years ago, if you were in the US, you weren't texting anybody. Uh, you weren't using an iPod. There was no Wikipedia. Uh, there was no Xbox. You know, you weren't on Facebook, right? None of these things were, were around 20 years ago. Now, if we look at the past 10 to 15 years, this is things like um, cloud computing or Twitter or we, uh, the iPhone, right? Um, Airbnbs or Spotify or Uber. None of these were around 15 years ago. Now, if you look at the past five to 10 years, right? This is when we had the Android phones or, or Instagram, or we actually launched a rover, the, the Mars rover Curiosity to go to Mars. And then it discovered water on the surface of Mars. Um, or, or CRISPR, if you're not familiar with CRISPR, a couple, a couple just actually won uh, the Nobel Prize for it this year. So it's for, for gene editing. Now, <clears throat> what about just the past five years? Right? Just in the past five years, you've seen things like um, the Amazon Echo. You can actually launch rockets now and have them land back on Earth. You know, I just throwing the whole thing away. Uh, quantum computing is, is uh, started to take off, right? As we talked about earlier, Sophia was, was activated. There's 3D metal printing. You can actually 3D print a house nowadays. You can actually make food from thin air. And again, for those of us that live right down the road from a grocery store or a restaurant, that might not be a big deal, but there are a lot of people in this world that making food from thin air is literally game changing and life-saving, right? So, uh, you may have noticed I, I mentioned Tesla a few spots here. Um, this, to me, Tesla is a really good example of how people care about the future and how you can see it in the success of companies. Okay, so midway through this year, 2020, all automakers, every one of them, their sales were down, with the sole exception of Tesla. Now. Tesla today is the most valuable car company in the world. They're worth more than Fiat Chrysler, Ford, General Motors, Ferrari, BMW, Honda, Volkswagen, all combined. Now think about this. This company is only 17 years old and their flagship product, the Model 3, is only three years old. Okay? But, but this world of, of autonomous vehicles, right? AI powered cars um, and, and a sustainable future Right, electric cars. So we're not, you know, spitting all these poisonous gases into the air. This has really taken off and, um, and companies flourish because of it, right? You don't have to do one or the other. You can, you can do what's good for the world and, and still be good for your company. So the message I want to leave you with is technology changes at an exponential rate. And the world's going to change more in the next 200 years than it has, or in the next 20 years than it has in the last 200 years, right? And if you don't believe that, just think back to those last couple of slides I showed you. Go outside. What are people doing? They're on their smartphones. They're texting. They're getting GPS coordinates to go somewhere. They're watching videos, right? They're on social media. None of these things existed 20 years ago. And yet that's, that's what fills their days. Uh, today, right? None of it existed 20 years ago. And technology is only ramping up exponentially. And so the question that you have to ask yourself is, are you ready? So thank you very much uh, for attending. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Bill, for uh, your talk inspiring talk for showing us uh, you know, lots of examples and also for we weaving your stories to the narrative of the story. I just, I mean, there are so many cases where AI can do good and I just want to add one uh, a use case that I came across uh, just a few days ago. So there was a paper published uh, end of September by a, a research team at MIT and they were using AI to check whether people were COVID positive or not. And they were so good by actually by analyzing the cuff of people. 
little people coughing. <coughs> and they were so good, they could also detect whether asymptotic people had COVID. So, you know, you could imagine a user app, a user-friendly app uh, on your mobile phone. And every morning when you get up, you cough into your phone and then the algorithm tells you whether you are a with high probability a COVID positive or not. The question is, uh, how, how can you trust the algorithm? How do you know whether to trust this algorithm? And this is exactly uh, an issue that IQ is working on together with the World Health Organization, namely to develop a benchmarking framework to check the quality of AI models. So the group is working on, on guidelines to elaborate this uh, entire process, but it's also offering or working on an online platform, open source, that would allow the uh, testing of uh, AI models. And we have regulators like the FDA on board, European regulators, Indian, China regulators. So um, yeah, I think there is still you know, quite quite a bit of work to be done to uh, create confidence uh, of people uh, into AI. But I, I wanted to uh, you know, look, look at the question. You, you talked about the chatbots and uh, there was, there's a question related to chatbots. Uh, and the, the, the colleague was saying uh, that chatbots, they talk maybe in a, in a machine-like manner. It's not, not quite human-like. I think maybe there, there are two, from what I know, there are two, uh, maybe two different types of scenarios, people who would who don't like that. <laughs> and uh, maybe the chatbots still have to get much better, but then there are also studies that show that people actually prefer to talk to chatbots because they don't feel, you know, they don't feel judged. And even though they know, you know it's a machine, still uh, they, uh, they, they, they prefer that. Do you have this AWS, do Amazon have, do you have some, some data on how comfortable people are with chatbots? Uh, I mean, is it like, you know, if you have a young, like a three-year-old uh, growing up with a chatbot and the, uh, the, yeah. the I mean, chatbot it's, like, a, like a person of the family? It, it, the answer is, it's funny, because when I'm, when I'm talking with, with people about AI, the answer is almost always, it depends. Right. So, so chatbots, for example, um, as far as voices go, there are there are a lot more realistic voices that are out there nowadays. Just most people aren't using them. Um, one of those canned services that I mentioned earlier is called Polly, and it's got voices in male, female, uh, tons of different languages, tons of different accents. Like, let's say you want English, you could have um, a, a, a female from with an Australian accent speaking, or maybe a male with a you know, New York accent or, or whatever the case may be. <clears throat> but as far as chatbots themselves, yeah, it, it's kind of both, right? It, it's, um, there's, for example, I have a, I have a special needs son that he's, he's 16, but he's, um, you know, in the, in the head more like three. And uh, he, he talks to Alexa all the time. And that's actually helped him pronounce words better. Because, you know, if he's talking to, to me or his mom, He'll say something kind of unintelligible, but we know what he's saying. Well, she's unforgiving, right? Alexa, like, you, you need to say, you know, turn on the lights. You can't just say, Woo -hoo, right, and point. So, so it's really actually helped him out a lot, and, and he looks at her as, as a as a person. Um, there are there are a lot of if we if we think about it in a medical sense, <clears throat> there's a lot of cases where uh, it can be incredibly useful. For having, for example, in, in a hospital, you know, somebody can just talk to, they can find this bed and there's no one there. They can just talk and get, get answers. It's very helpful. Um, but that's also one of those AI, one of those ethical um, questions about AI is should, should AI be there to take care of people or is that, you know, dehumanizing them, right? Something. And different people have. You know, just like abortion, whether you're pro or against. I mean, there, there's there's a lot of really good people that just disagree on that point. Um, so so yeah, that's that's something that a lot of a lot of thought has been put into, and and it will continue to be. And and there's never going to be one right answer, right? So it's, it's kind of chatbots and, and as lots of other things, they're a tool. 
sometimes when I call into some place and, and it's, it's like push one for this, push two, you know, sometimes I'm happy to do that the little menu and it speeds things along. Uh, other times I'm just like pushing zero. I'm like, no, no, no. I want to talk to a person. I want to talk to a person. And, I, and I'm the same person. And sometimes I want this and sometimes I want that. So it's just, it's about providing capabilities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Bill. You uh, showed, uh, you went into some detail uh, on the example of face uh, recognition. And you said, oh, it's, it's, it's pretty easy. It's like a couple of lines of code plus uh, you know, a little bit of uh, overhead here. I mean, how, uh, and you said, you, know, you don't have to have really a, a PhD in machine learning. Uh, and uh, how, what's, what's the skills or maybe the skill gap right now that you see maybe also within, you know, within companies or with, uh, within your own companies on, on people uh, related to AI, how much do they know? How much don't they know what they should know? Does, does Amazon, for example, do you have you know, training courses on, uh, on, on these matters? Uh, do other companies uh, offer training courses? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's far more information out there um, for free that more than, more than you and I could <laughs> consume in our lifetimes, right? So Amazon has courses uh on this you know everything from from five minute little help you out here to full length courses you know for days and so forth um there are there are courses on coursera they're they're free there's courses on on, on lots of different platforms to learn there's a lot of websites and, and so forth um as far as how much technology you need to know it, again it really depends so i i mean i meet with customers pretty much every day that um, want to use AI, but they don't really know anything about it. And so sometimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll go through and, and talk to them about, you know, basic terminology and capabilities, right? Like what actually is a neural network? Um, what is the deep mean and deep learning? What is a, a, you know, convolutional neural network or an RNN or what is, what is the transformer all about? Or how do these things work? Um, you know, just so they can kind of get an understanding of maybe terminology, but um, I would say for the for the for the customers that I work with, it's probably like maybe 50-50. I mean, as far as they're they're all wanting to use AI, but some of them will go and train their own models, but a lot of them, a lot of them, just use those canned solutions, right? Because they they can do incredibly powerful things, and mm -hmm. and um, and that's why that's why they're there because customers have, have asked us over and over and over for this capability or or here's a really common thing, and so rather than have everybody reinvent the wheel, okay, well here you go, right? Here's here's a capability, and 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 we just like other companies come out with with new ones all the time, new capabilities all the time as something um, is is more and more useful, then then it makes it easier. So yeah, it, it really just depends on what you're doing. Um, uh -huh. And even the people that are training models themselves, honestly, there, there are so many sample um, like Jupyter notebooks out there that have, you know, the, 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 the code basically for a particular problem that even if you're training the model yourself, not really knowing what you're doing, you can still do pretty amazing things with your own models. So it's, uh, it's, it's really honestly a lot a lot easier than most people think. Mm -hmm. And staying with uh, face recognition and everyone, I think everyone on the audience knows that bias is a big problem uh, mm -hmm. that's to be tackled. Um, we had uh, a few weeks ago, we had a session dedicated to a gender balance. And, uh, you know, there was a discussion, uh, ImageNet, you know, has millions and millions of pictures, but uh, it would be useful to create a new data set with you know, ethically sourced images and you know, making sure that you don't have, for example, gender bias and you know, maybe other types of, of bias. So uh, yeah. how, when you, you mentioned uh, your recognition tools, so are you, uh, how, how are you ensuring somehow that when you train your models that uh, bias is 
taken out or reasonably taken out or how, how do you address that? Yeah, I mean, bias, people don't realize just what a big deal bias in, in data is, right? Um, for, for example, let's, 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 say you, let's, let's say you're at AWS, you know, it's a technology company. And so um, let's, let's talk about the hiring process. You know, you, you, you look at all these resumes and you look at the number of people that get hired. A lot more men typically apply than women. And so a lot more men get hired than women. I mean, it's just, you know, the percentage. I'm not saying that that's good or bad. That's just how it is. And so if you take an AI and it looks at that data, whenever it's going to look at a, a, a woman's resume, well, it's already dinged against it because, I mean, you know, statistically speaking, and I'm just, I don't know what the actual numbers are, but let's say 70% of, of you know, the, the, hire, the, the actual good hires are men. Well, this is not a man. So already, I don't think, I don't think that this person is, is good, right? So it's very easy for the data to bias for, against those things. And so, yeah, we're constantly, um, at, at, at AWS, it, it, it's a constant thing that we're looking at is bias. And we have different organizations within, um, within not only AWS, but within the Amazon, you know, as, as a whole, uh, looking at, at those exact things. A lot of effort spent on bias. Mm -hmm. I mean, quite, quite a few people are saying uh, it's very important for computer scientists or computer engineers to take a classic uh, in ethics. And just to you know, make them aware uh, yeah. how serious the problem is and what the ramifications of uh, what they're doing uh, might be. Are the, the, the graduates that you're becoming, uh, that, that you're getting these days, uh, the, the computer graduates, are they being taught ethics in school now? And uh, are you teaching those uh, computer engineers in case they don't have a background? Are you also offering ethics courses to your employees? So Amazon does offer ethics courses. Uh, as far as college graduates, I, I personally have interviewed many, many, many college graduates um, here. And honestly, I don't think I've talked to any of them <clears throat> that really had had understood um, the ethics the ethics portion so i mean it, it's pretty amazing now i was i was giving a, a talk at harvard uh, earlier this year and um i mean harvard's a well-known school so you, you would hope that they do things good and and, and they did their their their, folk, their students were actually talking to me a lot about ethics right so i'm not going to say it's completely um missing from universities but in my opinion my personal opinion is is that if you're going to uh, study basically anything, it should, ethics should be one of the things. I don't care if it's medicine or or mathematics or or whatever, right? Now, when you're talking about computer science, um, of course, AI is going to be more and more important in that field, and so I think it should definitely be required in there. Um, I think it's something that's lagged behind, to be honest with you. I mean, there are courses out there, but I don't see it as part of the mandated curriculum at most institutions. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that's uh, interesting. Then coming coming back to your shorts and, and the background, uh, <laughs> uh, yin and yang, uh, light and dark. Uh, and there is also a, a paper that was published in Nature Communications uh, at the beginning of this year in January. And they studied uh, where AI can actually help achieve the sustainable development goals. There are indicators, uh, like or 200 plus indicators. And then they also uh, identified where AI would actually be uh, impeding to reach the sustainable development goals. And one, one easy example is, you know, one of the sustainable development goals is that everyone should have a decent job. Sure. And, uh, you know, AI is going to be... Uh, Eliminating, you know, some jobs and uh, then creating other jobs. Uh, you know, it may not yep. necessarily be the case that AI is always uh, contributing to the uh, to the good of uh, mankind or humankind. So, well, but, um, but keep in mind though that that's that's true with any technology. I mean, you go back, 
you know, when, when the printing press came out. I mean, all these people that were handwriting books are now out of the job, right? Um, I mean, or or the car putting putting all these people dealing with horses. So I mean, that's that's been the case throughout throughout time. Um, so I mean, there's some people will be displaced, right? There's there's some things like like a taxi driver or like the drivers in general, you know, truck drivers, like those jobs, yeah, they'll go away. Um, but there'll be a lot more jobs created. So it, it's a matter of, <clears throat> it's not a matter of, of um, removing people from the workforce. It's a matter of, of what we need to do is, is understand what's going to happen. Because, I mean, this is, not, this is not new. It's been happening throughout time, right? So we need to understand what's happening uh-huh. and um, make it easier for people to be repurposed. Right. So, I mean, a lot of these, mm-hmm. a lot of these fields, these new fields that are coming, they might not even be very hard. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying all these fields are going to require, you know, college degrees or, or anything else, but it's just a different way of, of thinking mm-hmm. about it. Right. So, it, but it, but it is something that, that organizations, um, governments, whether they're local or federal or global, they they need to take very seriously. Yeah, it, it, it definitely something needs to be taken seriously. Mm. And one you know, part of the population that would be a lot affected by AI will be developing countries. And uh, you know, one of the, the questions from our uh, audience is: uh, Do you see any adoption trends on using AI in developing countries? Yeah, actually a lot. I mean, I, I gave one example, um, well, more than one, I guess, but, but like skin vision, right? Where they're talking about where now anybody in, in basically anywhere in the world with, with just a smartphone, um, which you can get, it's, it's really surprising. Even people in, in developing countries that don't have access to water, it seems like they do have access to a smartphone, whether it's them personally or you know, someone in the town or village or whatever, they're, they're incredibly prolific. So, so now, you know, the closest doctor is 200 miles away. Well, they have actual access right here. Someone in the, in the village will have a smartphone. They can just take a look themselves. Right? Um, water is another thing. There's, there's um, I'm trying to think of their name. I want to say it's like Epay or I forget exactly what their name is. But um, what they're doing is they're using AI and IoT and so forth to provide uh, drinkable water to all of these places that didn't have it before, right? Um, we talked about salmon relief or making food from thin air. So, so there's, there's, there's tons and tons of examples of, of, of using AI and other related technologies to do this. One, one, one such example is, um, I think they're called WeFarm. Um, what they do is, is all of these farmers, so most of the world's food doesn't come from um, large companies. Most of it comes from from small farmers, right? And so, it, it, it's really sad that that a lot of that food just gets wasted. And so you have these farmers, these small farmers, that they depend on their livelihood throughout the world. I'm not talking in the U.S. I'm talking, you know, Africa or whatever whatever country or continent you want to talk about. Um, in particular, in Africa, there's there's a few countries where this 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 phone, the way it does is this application works on your phone. It doesn't have to be a smartphone, any phone, it can text. And it immediately it, um, automatically connects all of these farmers to thousands of other farmers in that same region, right? So they don't care what's going on in South America. That's, that's the weather's different, the climate's different, you know, the, 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 the soil's different. So if they have questions or um, they're wanting to sell their, their, their crops or whatever, now they just text, they just text what they're wanting to do, and the AI will automatically understand this and send it to relevant people. You don't want to just spam thousands or millions of people, right? It'll say, oh, these are these 10, 15 people seem like they would know the answer. And so <clears throat> it's really transformed the way that that um, that these people work, right? So and they don't they don't see it as AI. They just ask the question and it just they get answers. So yeah, there's a lot of ways where it's it's really transforming, um, even developing countries. Mm. Uh, there is another question. I think I, I happen to know the answer that uh, relates to the uh, the uh, COVID uh, 
research work that I was uh, you know, citing earlier. So the uh, there's a team at uh, MIT that's analyzing coughs, and then there's another uh, team at Carnegie Mellon. They are analyzing voice. I think there was a you know, question uh, here related to that. So Bill, if uh, if I'm a manager in a company and uh, I want to learn something about uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, maybe not the technical details um, and also on a possible impact. What kind, what book, is there a book or a couple of books uh, that you could uh, recommend that would be worthwhile for a manager to do that? So it, uh, um, <clears throat> It really depends. It depends on what you're trying to do, right? If you're trying to implement it, if you're trying to be able to speak the language to your developers because you're already doing it, if you're trying to get a bigger business picture of, of you know, so it, it depends on from what perspective. Um, one of the one of the best books I've, I've read, I even quoted it in my in, in, the, in my slides, is a book called The Inevitable um, by Kevin Kelly. It's about four or five years old, so you might think it's, it's really too old to be an interesting technology book, but um, it, it talks about what's coming in, in the very near future. You know, what's here and then extrapolates and what's coming. Um, it's, a, it's a really easy read. And I think, honestly, I think everybody should read it just to get a, a better sense of, of where the world is coming. Um, <clears throat> now, if you're talking about, if you're talking about having your teams work together, although it's, it's not AI related, but uh, a book I wrote a few years ago, The Phoenix Project, it, it focuses more on dev, DevOps, but it's, it's really good, I think, for, for managers. Um, they can be you know, lower level managers, middle managers, all the way CEO, whatever, for them to read. I think it's really good. Um, so I, it, it really just depends on what you're, what you're trying to accomplish, you know, what, what, the, what the, the person in management is, is wanting out of it. Um, I find that, I, what, I've, what I have seen before is managers, they want to understand AI, so they'll take some deep AI class, right, where they're getting right in the nuts and bolts and they're programming in Python and they're creating neural nets and, and, and everything else. And, you know, my, my question is, is, why are you doing this? You know, I mean, you're, you're spending all this time learning something you're never, ever going to use. You're not going to be the one developing these. So um, I would say keep it relatively high level, but yeah, there's a ton of places out there to, to, to learn. And just, just like with AI, honestly, the most important thing is um, asking the right question, right? So framing your question in the right way, that's gonna, that's gonna take you along your whole journey in a really good way. So to your question, frame it well. I wanna learn more about AI, no. no. What do you wanna learn about it? And why do you wanna learn that? Right. So, so focus on your question, and then, and then you can go from there. Because there's a ton of resources. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, uh, maybe one last uh, question. So there is a question about whether AI is going to be disruptive also for governments, and I'd like to uh, actually point out to uh, our episode that we'll have next week on Thursday. We are actually speaking to the uh, chief data officer of Estonia. And Estonia is like really, really, really serious uh, about uh, of digital transformation. And uh, they have about like 50, or maybe even more use cases, machine learning use cases, machine learning use cases running. And he will, he will talk about that. So I guess you're also talking to governments. So do you see AI going to be a big disruption also for government? Yeah. So. I, in, in my role right now, that's what actually who I, who I work with. So I work with, um, I work in the public sector. So state, local, federal governments, nonprofits, universities, things like that. And um, what I will say is that here in the US, um, the latest budget for AI was $1.5 billion for, for non-defense related AI research, $1.5 billion. Last year was $1 billion. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of money being spent on it. Um, I currently, every single customer that I work with for AI, every single one, no exceptions, they all are either government related agencies 
or their partner, partners that do work for the government, you know, the creating solutions for them. Um, if you think about the Japan 5.0 that I showed you, you know, they talked about briefly earlier, um, it, it, it really, it doesn't, doesn't matter what, what government you're talking about, whether it's in the US or third world country or, you know, somewhere in Europe or China. Um, in fact, actually, when, when AlphaGo beats the world's greatest um, Go player a few years back, that was actually what we call a Sputnik moment for China. So a lot of people look at it like, oh, okay, I, AI beat somebody at checkers, they beat somebody at chess, they beat somebody at Go, it's just the same thing. But it's not, it was not. When, when, when the, the machine beat the human at Go, that was a Sputnik moment for China and they decided that they, they needed to lead the world in AI. And so they made the uh, strong investments and they made the decision that by the year 2030, we will be the world's power in AI. So um, yeah, it's, it's having a huge impact on governments um, and it will continue to do so. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Bill. And uh, with that, uh, we will be uh, concluding our webinar today. Maybe uh, referring again back to your swords in the background, uh, which uh, <laughs> uh, light and dark. Yeah, let's uh, let's all hope and work towards uh, the light. Uh, towards the light. Things and uh, yeah, try to uh, tame the bad, uh, the dark side. Okay, so uh, thank you all to uh, uh, for listening in. So just to give a couple of uh, upcoming webinars that we have, uh, the uh, webinar with our chief data officer from Estonia is actually, it's up next Thursday, it's on the 10th of November. So 10th of November, please tune in to uh, hear from the chief data officer of Estonia, how Estonia is actually using uh, machine learning in its government services. And we also have on the uh, 9th of November, we have a pitching session, a pitching session for AI startups. And uh, the focus is uh, the uh, Silicon Valley startups that will be uh, pitching. And then on the 12th of November, so that's on Thursday next week, we actually have another talk from AWS. And it's on uh, disaster, disaster response. Uh, uh, improving disaster response at the edge and in pandemics uh, keynote that will be given by one of your colleagues. So with that, I would like to thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much uh, for uh, giving us your insight. And I would also like to uh, thank our sponsors and uh, Switzerland, uh, the co-convener of the Africa Global Summit. Thank you.